Okay, so, <clears throat> so I'm going to be talking to you about DNA replication, and then we're going to go on so, and, and look at transcription, and then we're going to go on and look at translation. So we're basically looking at these large polymers in the cells, these DNA molecules, RNA molecules, and, um, and how you assemble protein molecules. And we'll be looking at the process of sort of getting the process started, continuing the, pro the process, and then terminating. Okay, so all of these processes have um, initiation, elongation, and termination um, parts to them. So, um, let's have a, so let's have a look at DNA replication. This is taken from chapter 11 of the textbook. <clears throat> okay, so um, effectively, what we're talking about is during cell division, there's a phase of cell division where the DNA replicates, and that's S phase. So if you remember the cell cycle, it's got a G1 phase, GAP phase, S, G2, M, uh, mitosis. So we're, look, we're looking at what happens during S phase, where the cell replicates its DNA, and it only replicates its DNA once in the lifetime of a cell. Okay, so it's a highly regulated process. It's a process that is, you know, fundamental to cell life. I mean, you can't have a cell that can grow and replicate if you don't have DNA replication. So it's one of these fundamental processes. And what that means, it means you can study it way back in bacteria, in E. coli, and get a good idea of what's happening in what we like to think of these more complex mammalian cells, okay? So a lot of what we know about DNA replication comes from E. coli, and it's a process that's been fundamentally conserved over evolution. So what we know from E. coli helps us understand what we know in, in mammalian cells, okay? It's one of those fundamental cellular processes that's, that's highly conserved. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to be looking at um, the, the duplication of the cellular genome, and we're going to be looking at the sort of complex choreography that occurs so that this process can, can happen. Okay, so um, the textbook has three things here that it wants to tell you about, um, about DNA replication. Firstly, that it only begins at specific locations in the chromosome, all right? So there's, a, there's particular parts of the chromosomal sequence that don't code for proteins, they sort of, uh, the sequence is, is there to initiate DNA replication. So there's key sequences that are important to initiate the process. Once DNA replication begins, it, um, it, it occurs, it, it travels bi-directionally, in, in two directions, and then at each of these um, sites of replication, you have the double-stranded DNA being replicated. So this slide is represented pictorially on this one here. So if you look at the right side there, what we're saying is that Within this, um, this is E. coli, so we're looking at a circular chromosome, uh, a circular genome. There are key sites where replication will begin, all right? Let's assume the key site is here, all right? And then once the double-stranded um, genome is, replication begins, it, it, it's occurring at this point here and this point here. So it's traveling bi-directionally. So remember we were saying that it occurs at a specific location and it occurs bi-directionally, all right? And then the last point is that um, at each of these points where DNA replication is occurring, both strands of the double-stranded DNA act as a template to make a new strand of DNA, all right? So, um, so this is what it looks like in E. coli, and people study this by, we, we don't, need, don't need to know the details, but people used radioactive nucleotides to label up DNA, they put it on a photographic plate, and then they observed, you know, that the process, they, they got snapshots of cells that were replicating the DNA, and they were able to identify these particular regions of DNA where replication begins. So, um, forgive me if my mouse is wandering all over the screen. It disappears on here, even though it doesn't disappear on there. So sometimes when I'm moving the mouse, it's because I can't see it on the screen. I'm not trying to make you dizzy by doing that. Anyway, so there are particular um, sequences in the chromosome where replication begins, and this can be observed through various experimental techniques. And a little animation to show that, um, again from the textbook, 
Um, there's double-stranded DNA, this is the parental DNA colored in blue, and then you get these sites of um, where the origin begins, and then these bubbles of where, where the origin is beginning start to move in, in bi-directionally in two directions, and both strands are copied in those two directions. And eventually these bubbles meet and then join together to give you two copies from each of the parental strands. So each strand of the DNA acts as a template to make a new strand. So effectively, we refer to this as semi-conservative replication because um, of the new, um, in the new cell, one strand of DNA came from the parent and the other strand was synthesized. So it's, it's semi-replicative, semi-conservative replication. Okay, so, so um, when we talk about um, semi, oh, so when we talk about DNA replication, we have two strands to replicate. And if you remember back to, I don't know, I assume you know this. If you think, if you, if you think about double-stranded DNA, the strands run in opposite directions. Okay, and when we talk about the strand direction, we we have this nomenclature, which is it's we have a five prime end and we have a three prime end. So we talk about DNA. When we write DNA on a sheet of paper, we always write a sequence in the five prime to three prime direction. That's just what molecular biologists do, okay? So we always write DNA five prime to three prime. What, th th that nomenclature, I'm sure, again, you know this, but I'll say it anyway, it, it's based on the numbering of the carbons within the sugar molecule, okay? So ribose sugar has got five carbons, one, two, three, four, five. So we've got a five prime carbon, and we've got a three prime carbon. And the direction of the DNA is, is, um, is, is given by the numbers of these in the sugar. So effectively, when we say, um, when we're talking about DNA replication, I'll be telling you that replication occurs in the five prime to three prime direction. So the three prime end of DNA is being extended. Okay, so the three prime hydroxy on that sugar is where the next nucleotide adds. Okay, and you always add the new nucleotide to the three prime end, and that's how you make DNA. All right, so, um, so we've got two strands of DNA running in opposite directions. And we know from those previous experiments here that at any point of DNA replication, both strands are being replicated. So one strand is being replicated um, one strand runs in the five prime, three prime direction, the other strand runs three prime to five. They're opposites. But DNA is always synthesized in the five to three direction. So that causes a complication for the cell, all right? So we have this notion of a leading strand and a lagging strand, and it refers to the, um, the manner in which DNA is replicated or synthesized. So here's a better diagram to show it. So in blue, we've got the two strands of parental DNA. And at the top, the five prime and the three prime end of those parental strands is numbered, okay? So, so down at this end near me, um, on the leading strand, you've got the um, three prime end of the DNA, parental DNA at the bottom of the, bottom of the screen. The new strand of DNA running up the screen is being made in the five prime to three prime direction. So at the top there near the replication fork, maybe I should use a mouse, so at the top here, here, the, um, the newly, the, the nucleotides are being added to this, to this daughter strand here. Okay, and they're always added to the three prime direction. But because the other strand runs in the opposite direction, then DNA replication is occurring in that direction on the, um, on the lagging strand. So this bit of DNA is called, um, th this is the lagging strand and DNA is being made in the opposite direction. So, the replication, this bit here, the, 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 the parental strand, strands being unzipped and separated. So the, the way it's being unzipped is going, the strands are being separated up the screen in that direction. So these um, strands here are being pulled apart in this direction, right? This strand here is being synthesized in the direction that the replication, I've lost my thing. So the replication fork's moving in that direction, this strand is being extended in that direction. So that, that's gonna be easy for the cell. But the replication fork's moving that way, 
But this strand of DNA is being synthesized in the opposite direction. And I'll show you how the cell copes with that and is able to synthesize both strands of DNA simultaneously as the replication fork moves in one direction. Right? So um, it's kind of one of the most fascinating things if you're a molecular biologist trying to understand how this works. It's, I think it's really fascinating. Um, so, so we're talking about DNA replication and we're talking about elongation of a newly synthesized strand in the five prime to three prime direction because we're adding nucleotides to the three prime OH of the ribose sugar. Okay, so the three prime hydroxy of the existing strand, of the, of the primer strand, is actually um, like a nucleophilic center and, and it attacks the, um, the, the alpha phosphorus of the um, incoming deoxynucleotide. All right. So a nucleotide comes in and the three prime end of the existing strand attacks the, the triple phosphates, breaks off pyrophosphate, two phosphates get broken off, and a bond is made between the three prime OH and the incoming phosphate of the nucleotide. So there's a little um, chemical reaction here which kind of summarizes that. You've got uh, the, the existing strand, which is um, a bunch of um, nucleotide monophosphates in a long strand, so N, there's lots of them. A new nucleotide comes in and the new nucleotide is added to the existing strand and pyrophosphate is broken off. And that little equation here is drawn here in the textbook in terms of this, okay? So, Here's the template strand, here's the parental strand here, and here's the newly synthesized strand on the top, and it's being extended in the, in the three prime direction. So this ribose sugar here has got a three prime hydroxy, and to that, that three prime hydroxy attacks the inc incoming nucleotide, and it, it forms a, a, um, a bond, um, as shown here. So it comes in, and this attacks that and forms uh, um, a, a sugar phosphate backbone and then the new 3' hydroxy is exposed ready for the next nucleotide to come in. Okay, so the, the new strand is made in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction and the parental strand is read in the opposite direction because DNA is always anti-parallel. And so effectively um, pyrophosphate is removed and the incoming um, nucleotide is now added to the growing primer here. And as you can see um, in this diagram here, you've got um, base pairing between the parental strand and the incoming nucleotide. So you have a T base in the parental strand here, and you know that T um, base pairs with A, so the incoming nucleotide that's um, added to the strand is determined by this base pairing here. Okay, so this base pairing is very important to position the nucleotide so that the bond can be formed. All right. So whenever we're talking about um, DNA synthesis and elongation, um, we always, it's always made in the five prime to three prime direction and the, the newly synthesized strand requires a template. And the enzyme that makes the new strand of DNA is called, unsurprisingly, DNA polymerase. Okay, so DNA polymerase is gonna copy the DNA to make a new DNA strand. And the DNA polymerase cannot function without a template strand. Okay, so the enzyme has to bind to the template strand so that it can then make the new daughter strand. Um, now, to initiate, um, for, for the DNA polymerase to function, it requires that a short primer, in other words, a short bit of DNA with a three prime um, phosphate exposed is there on the strand. So, DNA t so the DNA polymerase requires that there's an existing bit of DNA waiting to be extended. And then the DNA polymerase will extend that for as long as it can to, um, to, to make a new strand of DNA. Now, the, the short primer that is required isn't made by DNA polymerase. DNA polymer, so effectively, if you think about DNA replication, you've got two strands of DNA which you somehow separate, and then you want to 
DNA polymerase to come in, bind to that bit of DNA and start extending. But it can't do that unless there's already a little bit of DNA with a three, three, three prime hydroxy group sitting there. And then the DNA polymerase will extend that. So something else in the cell has to start and make that what we call a primer, has to make that little primer bit of DNA so that the DNA polymerase can attach to it and extend the three prime end. Because when you separate two strands, there is no little bit of DNA with the three prime end attached, okay? So the enzyme that makes that primer is, luckily for us, it's called a primase. So it's easy to remember. You've got this other enzyme activity called a primase, and the primase will bind to the separated strands and it will begin to add nucleotides de novo from scratch. And it'll make a, a short run of primer and then the DNA polymerase comes along and extends that primer to replicate DNA. Now, um, the surprising thing about this, and I, I, I still um, am very surprised by this, is that the initial primer that's made is not DNA, it's RNA. So the DNA is copied into an RNA strand, and then the RNA strand, the DNA polymerase comes along, finds the 3' OH and extends it and makes DNA. So you get this hybrid bit of primer, which is an RNA-DNA hybrid, which is then extended into DNA. Crazy, all right? Cells are really crazy. And the only way to rationalize that, I think, I mean, we love to throw our arms up and have hypotheses and, and go to the pub. Friday afternoon is molecular biology night in the local pub and talk about these things. And the, 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 the idea is that before DNA existed, there was an RNA world where cells were RNA, and RNA replicated RNA to make RNA molecules, and RNA molecules had catalytic activity to work on other RNA molecules, and there was this little form of life that was kicking around that was RNA-based, and then DNA evolved on top of that, and the primase may be a relic of that. And you can argue at the pub, and there's people now coming up with data to support these arguments, but it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. But it's really fascinating, okay, that the, you've got this um, bit of RNA there. I digress, let's get back on topic. All right. So, um, so this is the first DNA polymerase that was identified in E. coli by Arthur Kornberg, right? And everyone got really excited that um, finally we've got this big molecule it's an enzyme and it doesn't, it's not an enzyme in the traditional sense. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't work in glycolysis to break down a sugar to make energy, as enzymes were. This is an enzyme that binds the DNA and replicates DNA, okay? So people had identified the first DNA polymerase called DNA pol one and obviously there's DNA pol two and there's pol three. There's a whole bunch of these different polymerases in E. coli. And um, the first one they identified was Pol1, and they studied it to understand how it works. <clears throat> and shown here are two active sites within the enzyme, within, within the molecule. And when you layer a bit of double-stranded DNA on here, you've got the um, parental strand shown here in blue, and the newly synthesized strand shown in red. And then the enzyme catalytic centers here um, effectively add the incoming nucleotide to the existing um, um, parental strand. Um, so, sorry, to the, to the new strand based on base pairing to the parental strand. So if you've got a, um, <clears throat> so effectively here, you get, um, just showing how So effectively, you've got the polymerase stepping along, moving along, like a train down a track, if you like, the, the DNA, and it's um, making a copy by matching these incoming nucleotides and adding them to the three prime end. So people started to understand um, um, the function of a DNA polymerase by studying DNA polymerase one. And they also noticed that DNA polymerase not only can it extend a strand, it can actually digest, it can break off nucleotides 
from the end of DNA as well. So we're talking about um, the, the DNA polymerases, they have exonuclease activity. Now, an exo means it digests the ends, an endo would mean it digests in the middle of a, of, of a bit of DNA. But we're talking about exonuclease activity here. And because you've got two, two ends to DNA, you've got a five prime end and you've got a three prime end of DNA, then there are two exonuclease activities. There's one that can digest from the three prime back towards the five prime, and there's one that can just digest from the five prime towards the three prime. Okay, you can't, one enzyme won't do both. One enzyme can only digest in that direction or in that direction. So from the left side or the right side, not both. So, um, so um, if it can digest the, um, in the three prime to five prime, it's called a three prime to five prime exonuclease. And if it's the opposite, five to three, it's a five to three exonuclease. So we have exonucleases associated with polymerases and they can work in either direction. Okay, so when it comes to studying um, how a polymerase works, the, um, the five prime, sorry, the three prime to five prime nuclear, exonuclease activity is referred to as a proofreading activity. So remember that the newly synthesized strand is made in the five to three direction. So the three prime end is being added to, okay? This exonuclease is digesting backwards from where the new strand. So it can actually chop off the new nucleotide that's been added. So if the wrong nucleotide is added, this exonuclease can cleave it off because it's working in the three prime to five prime direction, which is the opposite direction to which the polymerase is going. So if it's in the opposite direction, it can cleave off the newly added nucleotide and therefore if the wrong nucleotide's added, it can remove it. So it can make the process more um, can give it higher fidelity, okay? Um, so this proofreading activity increases the accuracy of the DNA polymerase by allowing it to remove an incorrectly added nucleotide and it, it, it increases the um, error rate by up to a thousand fold by having um, th th this activity. So again, my little animation to show that. So I've described these insertion points and these sort of, you know, these, th these catalytic activities. There's another site now I've added this red blob and this is the exonuclease activity and this is the proofreading one so it's in the three prime to five prime so it works in that direction okay so newly 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 added nucleotides are added in that direction and and the exonuclease works in that direction so effectively if you get in, incorrect base pair incorrect base pairing where a C is bound to a T rather than A being bound to a T, it's an incorrect um, um, insertion, then the exonuclease can come into play and it can cleave off that um, incorrect nucleotide and then effectively um, the enzyme can carry along adding the right nucleotide. And that um, makes the, the, the enzyme much more, um, it gives it greater fidelity. Okay. So that is a three prime to five prime exonuclease activity. Turns out the first polymerase discovered actually had a five prime to three prime, the opposite exonuclease activity. So, um, so the five prime to three prime exonuclease activity of DNA polymerase one was unique to DNA polymerase one. Something special about this enzyme having this unique activity. And initially when they discovered DNA pole one, they thought it was the enzyme that replicates the genome. So everyone was really happy. But then they, when they looked at it in more detail, they realized that its processivity, the speed at which it adds nucleotides, it's just too damn slow to replicate a genome. It, you know, if you, bacteria can replicate, you know, a new generation in 20 minutes, just bacteria replicate every 20 minutes. This polymerase cannot replicate a genome quickly enough for bacteria to grow. So it's not involved in copying the genome. Its main role is in DNA repair, and as we'll talk later, its main role in terms of DNA replication is to remove those pesky RNA primers that the primase is making. 
Otherwise, the newly synthesized strand would be a hybrid of RNA and DNA because the RNA, the, the, the primase kicked off DNA replication with a bit of RNA, which the DNA polymerase then extended. So there's a bit of RNA stuck in there. So this polymerase will actually remove those RNA primers. And um, again, I've got a little animation to show how it works here. So this is just um, the RNA polymerase one, and this is the bit of um, RNA that's been um, made by the primase, and this is the bit of the DNA made by the DNA polymerase. And then the, the other polymerase, this one here, it comes in to digest away um, in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay, so effectively it's, it's removing the RNA and replacing it with DNA because it can digest in the five prime to three prime direction and it can synthesize in the five prime to three prime direction. So the direction it moves, it's making DNA in that direction and it's chopping away RNA in the same direction. So it comes in after the polymerase is, the, the, the DNA polymerase has left, the, the first polymerase, and it removes the primer. All right. So we'll, 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 sh we'll look at how this fits into the big scheme, that complex choreography the book talks about of DNA synthesis um, later, but this is what it actually does. It's got this ability to um, digest um, DNA in the five prime to three direction and make DNA in the five prime to three prime direction. So it can actually um, play a role in removing the primase and replacing it, this, re removing the RNA and replacing it with DNA. Okay. But this is not the main enzyme that's going to replicate the genome. This is the one that comes in a bit later to remove the bits of RNA that were, were made. So um, the, the other thing people did when they started looking at these polymerases was trying to understand mechanistically how they work, like how can a protein replicate a bit of DNA? What's, you know, so we, we, we tend to think about cells and these complex enzyme machinery in cells as molecular, machine, molecular machines. Okay, so you've got these big enzymes, they've got hinges that open and close, they've got, you know, catalytic activities which grab things and add them and, you know, little, little, little molecular machines. So. Um, and that really comes into, you can really start to appreciate that when you look at the, the 3D structures of these molecules. So, um, so DNA polymerase um, structural studies reveal the, the basis for its accuracy. So the crystal structure of the polymer, polymerase, it's been described as looking like your, your hand. Okay, and I'll show that in the next, in the next slide. And um, the, the DNA lies in the palm of, of, of the hand. So here's the um, X-ray crystallography structure. So if you look at the actual research papers, this cartoon here is actually a, a, a good drawing, a good representation of what the actual crystal structure looks like. So if you get the X-ray crystal structure, you put a surface on that crystal structure, it looks like that. And that's what the textbook's using. It's not just something you know, one of the artists who works the textbook just drew off the top of their head. It's actually based on the X-ray crystal structure. And if you put your hand in that orientation there, you've got your fingers, which is the top left bit here. You've got your thumb, which is the next yellow bit at the top. And then you've got the, the red bit or the orangey bit, which is the palm of your hand, okay? And w w when this bit of DNA, w when this enzyme's working, it actually folds in on the, the DNA. So at some point when the DNA comes in, it actually comes in and grabs that DNA. And there's, there's flexible hinges which allow the fingers to move across. Okay? Um, and you can see here that they've put the, 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 some double-stranded DNA within the enzyme, which gives you a, a size, a, an appreciation of the, the size of this enzyme, how, how big it actually is. Okay? And um, so within this interior here within the, the, the enzyme is obviously has a shape, okay? And that shape's very important for determining the um, base pairing of the incoming nucleotide with the um, existing strand. So this is what the shape of the inside of the molecule looks like. 
And if you try and put some nucleotides into there, you can start to see how they fit. So within that shape here, you can see that correct base pa pairing between a G and a C fits within the shape of the palm of the hand here. And also a, an AT base pair fits within the palm, okay? But if you've got incorrect base pairing, which happens sometimes during, during DNA replication, when you get the incorrect base pair coming in, it's a poor fit, and it makes it more difficult to incorporate that nucleotide into the growing strand. So, um, so this is part of um, the high fidelity of the enzyme is, the, um, the, is just the, the incoming nucleotide um, having to match the shape of the enzyme. So again, this is the textbook drawing of um, DNA replication um, happening. And um, again, you've got the fingers now and you've got the thumb and the palm. Um, in this, I think in some diagrams of the textbook, DNA replicates in one orientation and in some diagrams it represents in the opposite orientation. I, I wish the textbook would be more consistent, it would be easier to understand. But in this one, the DNA is going um, to the left. So the three prime end, where's my mouse gone? All right. The three prime end here is being extended um, in that direction, okay? And this is where initiation began and it, this strand is being replicated in this direction here. And then within here is being, um, the new nucleotides um, are being brought in and then um, it's, and it's being extended. And when you get the miss, when the base doesn't fit properly, it then sort of, um, it doesn't fit in this region here, it breaks away and then it, it goes into the exonuclease side to be taken away. So um, this is the open form of the, um, the molecule, and then the fingers come over, bring the base in, and, um, and then um, extension can occur here. OK, so um, w w when people were characterizing these enzymes, they were looking at the, um, the, the processivity, in other words, how quickly can it add nucleotides to a, to a growing strand. And um, w when they were trying to work, it, to work out what was happening, they, they describe the process um, as being, the, the, the process of making DNA as being either distributive or um, processive, okay? So in, in, in one, the DNA polymerase is dissociating from the DNA and then rebinding. And in the other, it's um, sliding forward one base at a, at a time. So if, you, if this is the, the existing strand, the polymerase attaches and then um, has to move along to the next nucleotide to bring in the next one. It has to move along the strand. And um, if it's moving along without falling off, then that's processive. If it's falling off and then having to reattach, that's distributive. And another polymerase can come in and take over the synthesis of the first polymerase. So you've got this kind of thing happening. And again, the diagrams in the textbook um, showed here. So this is distributive synthesis, where polymerase goes along and at some point falls off, and then another polymerase can take over and continue um, the DNA replication. So we've kind of looked at some of the polymerase and, and the, the, the notion of extending DNA at the, five prime, at the three prime end, and we looked at some of that. So now we're going to sort of try and look at the actual complex that does DNA replication. Because don't forget, we've got a leading strand and a lagging strand. And we, we can quite easily see how the leading strand is synthesized in one direction, but how is the lagging strand made on the other strand whilst the first polymerase is, you know. Because all, both strands are made simultaneously from the same big complex. And the DNA polymerase is only part of that big enzyme complex. So, um, so we're going to be looking at um, a mechanism of DNA uh, at the DNA replication fork, so the, the bit where we've got two strands of DNA. And the advancement of the replication fork requires a whole bunch of different proteins, and I'll explain some of the obstacles that these proteins have to overcome. And 
when you put all of these proteins together, we don't say that you know it's a DNA um, that, that it's just DNA polymerase that replicates DNA. We say there's a replosome that rep replicates DNA because it's the DNA polymerase with all these other things. Okay, and um, so the actual DNA polymerase that's involved in DNA replication is DNA polymerase three in E. coli. Okay, so it's DNA pole 3 that carries out DNA replication. And it's the DNA pole 1 that comes in and removes that primer, primer, that bit of RNA that's included in the newly made strand. So um, RNA, um, DNA polymerase 3 is a bigger enzyme than pole 1, and it's made up of three subunits, an alpha, an epsilon, and a theta subunit. Okay, one subunit's got the DNA polymerase activity, another subunit's got the proofreading activity, and there's another subunit um, as well. Excuse me. So, this is showing the, 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 um, the, the DNA polymerase. Now, this is the, 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 the this yellow or mustard colored bit here is one DNA polymerase three. Okay, here's another DNA polymerase 3, and here's another DNA polymerase 3. So these polymerases are all attached to this big hollow enzyme. So hollow enzyme is just this big structure, this big molecular machine. Um, also part of this, so, so this machine here, um, one of these DNA polymerases, its sole function will be to replicate the leading strand. Okay, and then the lagging strand is made discontinuously. So this polymerase will start to, to extend a, prime, a prime, primer, and then this DNA polymerase will also attach to the, the lagging strand and start to attach and, and synthesize DNA. So we'll put this in context later where you can see how the DNA fits into this, this molecule. But, um, but you've got one big um, hollow enzyme that can replicate two strands of DNA, as in one, each strand of double-stranded DNA. And um, you've also got this thing called a beta um, sliding clamp. Now that is like a donut shaped thing. And if you can imagine, this is the DNA, this big donut thing attaches onto the DNA. And it stops the, D and then it attaches to the DNA polymerase. And if the DNA polymerase falls off like it does, because it's attached to the, that circular donut thing, it then just goes straight back into the DNA. So it's got nowhere to go, okay? So that's the, the, the function of this um, beta sliding clamp. One of its functions is to attach to the polymerase, and if the polymerase pops off, it just goes straight back on because it's attached. So, so you've got this beta sliding clamp. It's this donut made, of two, donut made up of two halves. How do those two halves actually fit around bit of single-stranded DNA. It's got to be some mechanism to put these two halves together, okay? And that's what this, um, this thing here called a clamp loader in. Um, it kind of reminds me of one of those, um, you know when you go into those arcade games and you've got all those desirable objects and you've got this big clamp that comes down and grabs them and tries to drop them into the thing. And it's impossible to do, you're just wasting money. Um, well, this thing is a bit like that. It's, it, it, it comes in, it gets the clamp, that donut shaped thing, it separates, opens up the, the two halves of the donut and it puts it onto the single strand and then it, it, it detaches and leaves the clamp on. So this is the clamp loader. So, and then you've got these tau proteins here which are involved in joining all these bits together. Okay, so this is the, 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 the big molecular machine, if you like, in E. coli that will replicate both strands of DNA. So, um, so, th so, so the, that, that clamp I was talking about increases the speed and processivity of the polymerase because it holds the polymerase in place. So the clamp is a homodimer and it's those two halves that make up that donut shaped object and um, it binds to and then um, slides along the, um, the, the, the DNA. So the, the beta um, clamp um, it also, not only does it encompass the DNA, it's two halves of the donut grab onto the DNA, but it also binds to the polymerase and therefore holds the polymerase in place.
and en enables um, the high processivity. Because remember, genomes are very large. There's many millions of base pairs of DNA that need to be replicated. You can't have the polymerase just falling off and then idly waiting for the next one to diffuse in and find its right place and then reattach and then carry on. You need to have a process where if it pops off, it can go straight back on again. So that's what the, 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 the clamp is doing. And so when we, I showed you that diagram earlier, the little animation that showed the polymerase extending, falling off, and then reattaching. Now what actually happens is that you've got this um, beta clamp that holds it in place. So when it actually falls off, it doesn't go anywhere and just reattaches and continues. And it makes the whole process much more efficient so that you can actually copy this ridiculously large genome. Okay. So don't forget human genomes are about um, six billion base pairs. And if you want to replicate six billion base pairs, you will need to have a highly processive enzyme to do that. Okay, so um, this is just looking at the other bit of the enzyme, the hollow enzyme, which is the clamp loader. So this clamp, this claw-like structure, it attaches to this um, beta clamp, what I was refer referring to as that donut thing, and it opens up the two halves of that um, structure and it locks it on to a bit of single-stranded DNA. And then once that's in place here, the, the polymerase will then attach, this polymerase can then attach to it to extend um, that purple bit, which is the primer. So that, that little primer bit there is actually the, um, was made by the primase, okay? So, um, and then that, pri that primer provides a three prime hydroxy group for the DNA polymerase to attach to and extend, okay? So again, Buried within this molecular machine, we're going to have to have the primase coming in as well to, to, to prime the whole reaction. Okay, so, um, so we've got a whole bunch of different proteins now working at the replication fork to replicate DNA. And these proteins work simultaneously in a highly choreographed way to carry the process. So we've talked about um, the polymerase 3 core, which is going to do the DNA extension. We've talked about the beta clamp, which holds the polymerase onto the DNA. We're going to talk about um, a DNA helicase, and I'll explain what that is, and a topo isomerase. Um, a primase is involved, which makes an RNA um, DNA hybrid, which contains a 3 prime end for the polymerase, the DNA polymerase to extend. We're going to have the DNA polymerase 1, which comes in to remove the RNA um, primer. And then we've got a ligase that fills in the gaps. And we've got these single-stranded binding proteins that because we're opening DNA, DNA up into single-stranded DNA, it's very fragile. So these single-stranded binding proteins bind and protect the, um, the DNA from endonucleases and things like that. So we're now going to sort of um, look at some of these other players that are involved at the replication fork. Um, and just, just quickly, um, I'll preempt what we're going to look at by saying that the helicase is involved in unwinding the parental DNA because the replication fork has to separate two strands of DNA from each other. And when you try and, I don't know if you've ever played around with bits of string when you were a kid, if you get, you know, two bits of string and wrap them around each other like a double helix and then you tie a knot at one end and then you try and pull apart the two um, shoelaces. The further you pull them apart, the more torsional stress you cause behind the way you're pulling apart to the point where it gets very difficult. Okay, so the helicase is trying to pull apart these strands and as it's pulling them apart, it's introducing torsional stress in the double-stranded DNA. Okay, it's not a hard concept, you just got to think about what's happening. So to relieve that torsional stress that you're introducing, you've got this thing called a topo isomerase that can cleave the one strand of DNA and let it wrap around itself and then reattach it. So the topo isomerase is relieving all of this torsional stress that the helicase is introducing. And I'll sh I think I've got some diagrams that might mention that, I'm not quite sure. So 
proteins involved in DNA replication. We've talked about the DNA polymerase 3, and we've talked about this beta clamp, which is um, involved in, in holding on, wrapping around the DNA and holding the polymerase in place. And then we know that that can just simply extend. So I think we're quite comfortable with that. Um, this is the helicase I was talking about. And it's, it's not a monomer, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's made up of six um, subunits. And what it's gonna be doing, it's gonna be um, pushing through the DNA and unraveling it, unzipping those strands of DNA. But as that's happening, it's not shown here, but this DNA, as it's being pulled, as it's being unwound, it, it's, it's getting more and more torsional stress, okay? Again, if you think about DNA, B-form DNA that you studied, maybe in other subjects, it's, um, I think, one twist of the DNA is 10 base pairs. That's just what B-form DNA is. And as you try and pull it apart, you're actually putting um, more, you know, you're actually introducing more twists than, you know, um, that then B form DNA can, can hold. So, anyway, so as you've got the helicase overwinding the DNA as it's trying to unwrap it, then the, this, this topo isomerase is like a pair of scissors and it cuts one strand, it relieves that torsional stress by allowing the DNA to wrap, you know, unwrap around itself, and then it rejoins the DNA. So, it, it cuts it and um, reattaches it. And it just relieves the torsional stress that the helicase um, is introducing. And then also, um, once the helicase has separated the two strands of DNA, we know that DNA synthesis doesn't start with DNA polymerase, it starts with the primase. And the primase is gonna um, copy that strand of DNA, but it copies it and it makes an RNA DNA um, hybrid. So the primase is going to add um, a, a, a short region of RNA there. Now that RNA will have a 3' prime hydroxy and then the DNA polymerase can attach and start copying DNA in earnest. So the primase is just a very short little bit of um, DNA-RNA um, hybrid. And then <clears throat> later on when we're looking at DNA um, synthesis you often have the um, now the DNA polymerase has been extended the primer here and, and then um, at some point it will come across another bit of DNA that was added by another um, DNA polymerase. So you get these, um, there's no sugar phosphate bond between these two bits of DNA. So you have a, an enzyme called a ligase that can't add nucleotides but it can make a phosphodiester bond between two adjacent um, nucleotides. So the ligase um, just simply joins um, those two um, nucleotides that are in place together. Okay? And I'll show you where in the process of DNA replication the ligase has its role to play. And the last thing that was in that slide of all the bits that we need to replicate DNA was this thing called an SSB, or this single-stranded binding protein. So as you're unwinding um, the DNA, you get this single-stranded DNA, you get these little structures forming, but basically the single-stranded binding protein binds to DNA and um, protects it from being broken down and also keep it in, in a structure that can then be replicated um, and, and protected from the cell. Okay, um, I'll take a short break. Um, I'm up to slide number, I don't know, I've got about 25 slides to go, so I'll just take a five minute break, 10 minutes if you need to go and get, stretch your legs, and then um, I'll, I'll start again at five past. Anyway, so let's carry on looking at this process of, um, of DNA replication and how all these bits fit together to um, coordinate themselves to um, replicate some DNA. So, so, I've just been describing to you the helicase, which is um, this one here that's unwinding the DNA. And it turns out that, um, so, so the, 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 the helicase um, connects to the DNA polymerase 3 and um, it, binds the D, it binds to the DNA polymerase. 
and um, this um, speeds up the, the rate of DNA replication by the polymerase. Um, and also, once the polymerase is attached to the helicase, it enhances the helicase. So the helicase can normally unwind about 35 base pairs per second, but once it's attached to the polymerase, it can unwind DNA at about 700 base pairs per second. So the interaction and activity of all these enzymes is dependent on them being, you know, um, bound to each other. Um, so the helicase activity is stimulated by its connection to the DNA polymerase. And <clears throat> so now we've got to consider DNA replication for two strands of DNA. So we've got two replication forks going in opposite directions. And at one of these replication fork forks, which is what we're looking at, we've got, you know, two strands of DNA to replicate. Um, so we've got um, the strands are referred to as the leading strand and the lagging strand. Now, um, the leading strand, um, the, the, the DNA polymerase and the, the, the helicase move continuously together in the same direction. So replication of DNA at the leading strand is much easier for the cell and it's quite straightforward. With the lagging strand, the, um, the, the clamp um, repeatedly moves um, for a short period of DNA and then it has to, um, it, it leaves and has to reattach. And then a little bit of DNA is replicated, it leaves and reattaches. So we'll look at um, how this problem, we'll look at what it looks like and we'll, we'll see how the machinery copes with, with, this, um, with, with doing this. So this is what I, I mentioned earlier, is that um, we looked at one of these replication forks here, and then we've got the helicase moving in that direction, so the DNA is unzipping in that direction. So for the, lag the leading strand, once the primase has made its bit of RNA, and once the DNA has attached and has started to extend that bit of DNA, that DNA can just keep extending as long as the helicase is unwinding the DNA and, and opening up the, that strand. So, DNA synthesis on the leading strand is simply a case of putting the primase on there, making a primer, and then attaching the polymerase and letting it run. And it will run in the same direction as the helicase is opening the DNA, and it's just a continuous process. So, um, so DNA replication on the leading strand is easy because it's in the same direction as... Oh, where's my mouse? It's in the same direction as... The, the fork is opening. With the other strand, the DNA is opening in that direction, but each bit of DNA is made in the opposite direction. So you have to have multiple primers, primase, attaching to make multiple primers, which can then be extended, okay? And then by the time that bit of DNA is extended a short distance, the helicase has moved far enough away to then drag the polymerase off, you know, because so, let me try and explain it. So this is the enzyme, the hollow enzyme complex shown here. And now we can overlay this replication fork onto that enzyme structure there, which is what this transition here is meant to do. You can just sort of see now, should it work? There you go. So, so that's looking at now the, the big hollow enzyme at the replication fork. So, we're not going to quiz you in detail about what's going on here because it's quite complex and we could spend lectures and lectures talking about this, all right, because there's a lot, lots known. But what you can see here is that... Where's my mouse? I don't know why my mouse keeps disappearing. Take my finger off the trackpad for like 10 seconds and it's gone. All right, so, so here's the, um, this bit here is the same as this bit here. So this is the DNA that's gonna be unwound, okay? So here's the helicase that's gonna be unwinding the, the, the DNA and then you're getting um, semi-conservative replication on the leading strand in that direction. And, you, oh, geez. and then you've got um, the lagging strand being synthesized necessarily in the opposite direction because you can only make DNA in the five prime to three prime direction, okay? And the strand is, is a bit more difficult because it goes in 
the opposite direction. So what happens here is that one polymerase is attached to the leading strand and it just keeps running and running and running, making more DNA. Whereas with the other strand, the attached to the helicase here, the primase attaches. And once the primase is, is attached, it makes a small bit of RNA um, primer here. And then once that RNA primer is, you know, I don't know how long it is, but you know, I imagine, you know, it, it's fairly short, the, the primer leaves and then the DNA polymerase attaches and then can um, begin to extend. And there's one, so, so effectively this one was attached first and then this one was able to um, extend. Um, so, so this one here is being made in the three prime direction this way and this one strand here is being, has been made in that direction. And then this primer here was extended in that direction. And then this primer here was extended in that direction. And then this primer here will be extended in that direction. Okay? So um, as this is moving along, these enzymes can only extend a certain amount of DNA before they before they're, have to move along with the replication fork because it's all, all joined together. So, um, so you get this looping of the DNA coming out here in between these polymerases so that the DNA can be passed through the polymerase and, um, and, and ex you know, m m make these short fragments. So these fragments of DNA that are made on the lagging strand are referred to as Okazaki fragments. And it's named after the Japanese scientist who, who, who managed to identify these short segments of DNA being made on the lagging strand. So the, the fragments are named after him. So these are the Okazaki fragments. And there's multiple Okazaki fragments on the lagging strand because its direction of synthesis is in the opposite direction to um, the direction that the helicase is moving. And you don't have Okazaki fragments on the leading strand. You just have one continuous long fragment of DNA being made on the leading strand. Um, so there's various models that sort of are being hypothesized that describe this process here. I think this one here is referred to as the trombone model. So if you think of a trombone player, when he extends the low notes, he pushes out the trombone arm. So these bits of DNA were thought to sort of be extending out um, as, the, as the DNA is being replicated, so it's called the trombone model. And there's probably people with other um, hypotheses of how the actual thing is, is occurring, because it's a complex process, and it's, um, you know, obviously you can't get an X-ray crystallography structure of this thing, it's just too big to study. So people are studying it in lots of, you know, interesting ways, and coming up with various hypotheses which they then try and prove. But basically, um, this is the large hollow enzyme made up of three polymerases, these beta sliding clamps, a, a, um, a helicase, which is unwinding the DNA, these primases that is making these short regions of RNA, which is then being extended by the RNA polymerase 3. Okay, so a lot of DNA synthesis is occurring here, all right, in this fairly efficient machine. And um, we're getting these loops of DNA repeatedly growing out of the hollow enzyme um, and then collapsing as the enzyme is, is letting go of the DNA and having these Okazaki fragments being made. And um, each Okazaki fragment begins with one bit of RNA primer which is then extended by the RNA polymerase 3. And the polymerase 3 keeps going as long as it can until it hits the previous bit of primer and then when it hits that previous primer it falls off so each Okazaki fragment is extended up to the previous one okay um, and that's this model of the DNA sort of looping out as it does is referred to as the trombone model and I don't want to go into this it's, it's, it's you just have to read the textbook and look at it if you really want to dig down deep into this but um, as the replication forks moving in this direction here you've got the um, the the RNA primer here and then the polymerase here extending that primer 
in the three prime direction. And it'll keep extending until it hits the, the previous primer. And then as it extends, this bit of DNA loops out, as shown here. So you get this looping out of the DNA, um, and eventually the, um, the, the more distant um, bits of DNA that have been made, uh, once they hit the primer, the polymerase detaches and then can swing around and reattach to form another bit of, um, extend another bit of um, primer. So there's this model here of, um, of how the DNA is continually, the, the polymerases are continually reattaching on the um, lagging strand to make these Okazaki fragments. So on the lagging strand then, you've got these Okazaki fragments which contain these regions of RNA within the regions of DNA. So short sequences of RNA uh, are there. So this is when our friend, our first polymerase to be identified, RNA polymerase 1, this is where its real role is in DNA replication. So the DNA polymerase 1, it can, um, because there's a gap between the DNA and the RNA from the previous Okazaki fragment to the beginning of the next Okazaki fragment, there's a gap there that hasn't been joined. So the, um, the polymerase can identify that gap and then it can start to extend and digest away the RNA and synthesize DNA simultaneously because its exonuclease is in the same direction as its polymerase. So it can read through the um, RNA and digest it away and replace it with DNA, as I showed in that slide from earlier on in the lecture. So, um, so once the polymerase has synthesized new piece of DNA to replace the RNA, this enzyme which we mentioned earlier called a ligase, it comes in. The ligase doesn't, um, isn't involved in bringing nucleotides in. All the ligase does is join existing um, nucleotides together. So nucleotides that are in place on the parental strand are joined together. So these nicks between DNA fragments are joined by the ligase. And the, when we looked at this process here, you can see that you know, this clamp loader is adding these, be these beta clamps to the DNA and then you know, the primer gets involved and the DNA polymerase gets involved. But the, the clamps get left behind once the DNA polymerase detaches. Once the, the DNA meets the RNA and the Okazaki fragment is fully extended, these clamps are left behind. And they serve a purpose, it seems, is that the clamps that are left behind can then bring in the DNA polymerase 1. And then it can also bring in the ligase. So these clamps mark the spot where the polymerase has got to come in to remove the RNA. So again, the, di the book's got a little diagram. So shown to the left here, I've kind of graded it out to not focus on it too much, but there's this diagram shown in the book. I'm just sort of describing the first two steps of this diagram here. So what we have is two Okazaki fragments, and this fragment has been extended to butt end against the previous Okazaki fragment. So each Okazaki fragment begins with an, a the primase that made a bit of RNA, this RNA primer, which was then extended by the DNA polymerase. So the upshot of all of that process is you get a gap here between the previous bit of DNA and the beginning of the next Okazaki fragment, the RNA. So this here is where the beta clamp is left behind. So then the, the polymerase 3 detaches, but then polymerase 1 comes in and it binds to the clamp again and then what it polymerase one will do it will digest the rna and simultaneously synthesize that bit of dna and it'll just basically replace rna for dna and then once that's happened um the uh, dna polymerase one detaches and what's left behind here is a nick between two bits of dna and then the DNA ligase then just joins those two bits of DNA together to make a <laughs> continuous section of DNA so that there's no sort of mutations or, you know, you know the, you've got this nice continuous piece of DNA. So all the Okazaki fragments are joined together and all the bits of RNA are removed. Okay. Um, yes. So the, the, the thing is, if, if you look at 
these um, activities, like, you know, you've got the exonuclease activity of an enzyme and you've got the ligase and you've got the, um, the NIC translation where it can, you know, all of these enzymes have been purified by molecular biologists and used in the laboratory to manipulate DNA and all of our ability, our ability to clone and make DNA and do PCR and all of that kind of stuff we do in the lab is all based on, comes out of this fundamental research where they understood how all these enzymes worked, they purified them, and then companies got involved, manufactured them, sold them to labs, and now labs use these. I'll, I'll have some DNA polymerase, please, and some ligase, and I'll have a bit of this, this, that, and then you can start to manipulate DNA in the labs. So an understanding of all of this process um, is not just good from an academic point of view, but it's also led to these amazing tools that molecular biologists now have access to to manipulate DNA um, in, the, in the laboratory. All right. Um, and um, I guess, again, because I've got a bit of time, a bit of a side issue is that when I was working at um, a previous university and I'd just finished my PhD, um, another student had um, sort of, was, he was in, really into this idea of um, tools and, and making things, do things. And he came up with some concepts of, you know, using enzymes to do these things with DNA. And he started up a biotech company, a little startup company. And I went to work for them for a couple of years and doing lots of assays to develop these techniques to on sell to people in the industry to form a company. So, you know, if you get any bright ideas when you're in the labs and you think, wow, wouldn't it be great to do this? Or, wow, well, you could make this and do this, then, you know, there's opportunities there to start up biotech companies and to do stuff. And it happens quite frequently within the unis. Okay, so if you get any bright ideas, have a chat with your supervisor and say, let's do this. Anyway, back to reality, back to the lecture. Um, okay, so we've been described, I've been describing to you what happens in E. coli, and a lot of what we know from E. coli can be translated into eukaryotes. Now, there's been a lot of evolution between the two, a lot of time. So in eukaryotes, things are a bit more complex and sometimes, you know, there's extra bits come into play. But when you look at the actual processes and compare them one for one, it's the same kind of process, but just a modified form of, the, of, of an earlier process. So in eukaryotes, um, um, replication proteins are functionally similar to those that we've identified in bacteria. So in eukaryotes, we still have polymerases, DNA polymerases, we still have clamps, we still have clamp loaders, um, we've still got helicases and topoisomerases, we've still got DNA being extended in the three prime direction, we've still got sem semi-conservative DNA replication. It's all there, but it's just a bit different because um, of the way things are. And I'm not going to try and explain to you what happens in eukaryotes in any detail, just to say that um, I'll, I'll just point out some of the similarities in passing. Um, so in eukaryotes, there's more proteins involved in replication, and um, people are still identifying extra bits that um, are known to be involved in eukaryotic DNA replication. Um, so. Earlier, when I, when I came in here and started talking to you generally, I was saying with these biological processes, we've got an elongation, an extension, and a termination phase. So we've been talking about elongation. We've been talking about how these enzymes make more, you know, extend the, um, the, the polymerases. Um, I guess the other thing we've got to think about briefly is, is how do we initiate DNA replication? Because we know DNA replication only occurs once in the lifetime of a cell, so there has to be mechanisms to, um, you know, to, to, to control that, and they also occur only at certain regions. So the origin of replication, where DNA replication begins, is it, it's, it's the primary point at which control um, has its effect. So th th these control mechanisms control the initiation of replication at the origin of replication. And once replication begins, you're basically committed to complete the process and then to undergo cell division. Okay, so the initiation of entering into S phase is one of those key committed 
thing cells do, and once you enter S phase, and that's, you've got to go through DNA replication, and then you've got to go through mitosis and give two new cells. Okay. So the control of initiation is a very important decision for the cell to make, and, um, and initiation in eukaryotes is a bit more complex because you've got more than one site of initiation of um, replication because um, we've got, you know, We've got many more chromosomes than we have in E. coli. You've just got one circular genome in E. coli. We've got multiple chromosomes. And also each chromosome's got multiple start sites where, where replication begins. So, um, so just looking at this process of initiation of DNA replication, um, the amount of DNA that's made at, from one site of um, initiation is called a replicon. Okay, and we have a bunch of initiator proteins that are involved in driving the um, initiation of DNA replication. Um, and effectively what has to happen at the site of initiation is that um, the DNA strands need to be separated and unwound to allow the gubbins of all that machinery to, to, to take hold and then to start extending. Okay, so you need to actually separate double-stranded DNA and form this sort of replication bubble where things can get involved. So at the site of initiation, um, you have to have an ordered sequence of, of events. So the, in, e, in E. coli, where this is well understood, the origin of replication is defined by about 245 base pairs of DNA. And it's within that 245 base pairs of DNA, it's got... Um, it's got this nine nucleotide repeat, and it's got four copies of them, and it can bind these other proteins called initi initiator proteins. And also, at or near this origin of replication, there's also these AT-rich regions of DNA. Now, if you think back to what you know about complementary base pairing and DNA, then GC base pairs have three Watson Creek base pairs between a, a G and a C. Okay, so it's very difficult to separate GC DNA. So if ever you do a PCR reaction in a lab and you've got GC rich DNA, you need to have high melting temperatures to really pull apart the GC base pairs. When you've got runs of AT base pairs, A and T, and you've got runs of those, you've only got two Watson Creek base pairs holding those strands together. So AT rich DNA is much easier to separate than GC rich DNA. And the cell takes advantage of this and you have these AT-rich regions of DNA in these um, origin of replication sites so that the cell can easily separate, I use that word, qualified statement, easily um, separate the AT-rich DNA so that you can then initiate um, a, a replication fork. So you've got these um, DNA A proteins which, um, which oligomerize I can't say it properly, <laughs> which, which bind to the DNA and they, they kind of wrap around the DNA and they um, unwind the DNA at the AT rich region. So you know how the helicases can in introduce torsional stress by unwinding the DNA? Well, these DNA A proteins, they wrap around the DNA and they cause unwinding of the DNA. Rather than torsional stress, they're relieving the torsional stress and then the AT rich DNA can separate. And, oops. So effectively here, you've got this oligomerization site here where those um, DNA A proteins can bind. And then when they bind and change the torsional um, twisting of the DNA, they allow these AT rich bits of DNA to just open up and unwind. So without heating the DNA in a PCR machine to melt things, you get wrapping of the DNA reducing that torsional twist, which unwinds, allows those AT base pairs to separate. And therefore, you start to open up a bubble of DNA here, which then becomes a replication fork. Okay, so the sequence of DNA here is very important to assemble these proteins to unwind this bit of DNA. Um, so the these origins of replication, they only fire once per cell cycle. Um, and you have this, I'm not gonna go into the detail of this, but you have um, 
in eukaryotes a pre-replication complex. So before replication can begin, you've got these things that have to assemble on the DNA. So it's called a pre-replication complex. And these assemble in um, late G1 before S phase occurs. So before you enter DNA synthesis, which is an S phase, so late in G1 phase, you get this pre-replication complex forming in cells. <coughs> Excuse me. And then um, you then get <coughs> a series of events driven by kinases <coughs> that um, phosphorylate and deassociate the replication complex. I should have brought some water with me. Um, and then there's other factors involved as well, involved in um, <clears throat> um, unwinding the DNA and ready for readiness for replication. And this is just showing the phase of the cell cycle where this occurs. So during um, G1 phase, the pre-replication complex forms, and then once we hit into S phase, certain kinases trigger a response, certain signals trigger these cells to grow, and then S phase is triggered. And once S phase is triggered, the cell is committed to completing DNA replication and then is, com it then is, is committed to undergoing mitosis to give two daughter cells. And in each daughter cell, you've got um, semi-conservative um, DNA shown here. This is just showing some of the enzymes, which we don't need to know about, um, involved in this pre-initiation complex. So you've got these, um, these helicase type molecules coming in and these, these other proteins, which um, are involved in this um, DNA, um, um, in, in, in opening up the DNA at these origins of replication. Um, so once you've once the origin of replication has been marked and these proteins have come into place, you then get the assembly of the hollow enzyme that's going to replicate the DNA. And this is all I'm going to say about the eukaryotic um, hollow enzyme, is that it's made up of a bunch of subunits which we should recognise from our looking at E. coli. And you don't need to know the names of all these things, but you've got the REC protein here, which looks very much like the helicase. You've got the um, polymerase E, which looks very much like um, one of our DNA polymerase 3 from E. coli. We've got the clamp loader, which has got another name. We've got the beta clamp, which has got another name. We've got, um, you know, so a whole bunch of new proteins as well. And they come together to form this complex which when you compare it to the, what happens in E. coli, you can see it's the same functional machine, but the, you know, the genes have evolved and the sequences have changed and new things have come in to play. And you have this, um, you have this mechanism to rep replicate DNA. And again, you've got a leading strand and a lagging strand. So you've got Okazaki fragments, you know, and, and you've got the whole um, um, series of events that we, we've seen in in E. coli. So, so you've got, so that, that describes very basically initiation. We've looked at elongation, so the only other thing to look at is termination. Okay? Um, termination in, in E. coli involves, you've got a circular genome, so it involves those replication forks working through the genome and then clashing at the other end. And when they clash, they, they're able to unwind each other and there's a bunch of enzymes that come in and then um, you can separate the, the two circular molecules from each other to have two independent molecules. So in E. coli, there's this specialist machinery, which we're not going to go into. I think the, the book's got some details if you're interested. Um, and then you get the, um, the, the separating of the two newly synthesized, um, or, or, or you get the, the separation of the, the two strands. Um, in eukaryotes, we've got a different problem because we don't have circular DNA in eukaryotes, we have linear DNA, but what we have in, um, in eukaryotes is an end replication problem because it's difficult to replicate the ends of linear chromosomes. And we'll look at that. So at the ends of our chromosomes, we don't have genes at the ends of our chromosomes, we have sequences called telomere sequences.
All right? So the end of every chromosome in our bodies, um, the, end of the, the, the end of that linear bit of DNA, it's got these repetitive DNA. It's a six, it's a hexama repeat, G, 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 um, I should know it. Um, so it's G, 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 T, T, oh, it's just show, um, G. It's, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. So it's a, it's a hexamer repeat. So it's these six <coughs> nucleotides that repeat again and again. Um, and if you, I've got a diagram which I'll, I'll look at here. So let me just read this slide to you, then I'll show you the, 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 the figure. So, so when we get to the end of the, 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 chrom the chromosome, we've got an RNA primer at the extreme end of the chromosome. Okay, and what has to happen is that the RNA primer needs to be digested away and then replaced with DNA. So if you think about it, this is your chromosome here, and at the end you're going to have a bit of primer attached here. So something has to attach here to that digested away, but there's nothing to attach to. So it can't attach to digest away that bit of RNA. So you end up having this problem that, you know, I'll show that in a diagram. So the, the, there's no three prime terminus for the DNA polymerase to extend from. So effectively you get this, this gap between the Okazaki fragments which can't be joined or, you know, because the RNA can't be replaced. So effectively each time you replicate the genome, you shorten the chromosomes by a, a small fraction. So there's a diagram here that tries to show that. So here's our sort of linear chromosome, if you like, with the two ends. And then you've got this origin of replication and then you get the replication fork moving towards each end of the chromosome. So as this replication fork is moving towards the end of the chromosome, it's easy for the, lagging, for the leading strand because it will just be extended up until it reaches the end of the chromosome, the polymerase falls off and the entire chromosome is copied. So that's not a problem. But for the other strand, you've got this, these Okazaki fragments. So eventually, at the end of the chromosome, you've got this Okazaki fragment here with a bit of RNA here, and um, then there's nowhere for the, the polymerase to attach to then digest away that bit of RNA. So effectively, you get a shortening of the strand of DNA at, the, at that end of, of, the, um, of the lagging strand. And then when you repeat that process in the second generation, you get this now, the, 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 the newly synthesized strand becomes the parental strand in the next generation. And then it will be, it can only be extended up until, up, up until here. So you've lost that bit of DNA. And then at this end of the newly synthesized strand, you're gonna lose that end of the DNA. So as you go through generation and generation, you get a shortening of the chromosomes. So that is one of the things that limits our cells to the number, number of rounds of replication a cell can undergo is because you lose the ends of the chromosomes. And that, that gives um, a replicative lifespan to, to, to cells. So you've got you know, um, only a certain number of replications that can occur um, before you, th this actually starts to eat into the coding sequences of, of the chromosomes. So how do cells um, overcome this end replication problem? Okay, so not all of our somatic cells can do this, but some of our cells can overcome this problem. All right, so we have an enzyme called um, telomerase. And telomerase is able to extend the um, ends of the template chromosome in the absence of a template strand. So it can make the chromosome, that's that strand that needs to be re replicated, can make that strand a bit longer. And then um, we can then copy that. Okay, and I've got a diagram that shows how this, that, that happens. So we've got the telomerase enzyme, which within the enzyme, it's got some RNA embedded in its own enzyme. So it's, an, it's a riboenzyme, or what's the word, um, a ribozyme. It's a, it's a protein, um, RNA complex which forms telomerase and the bit of RNA that's a part of the enzyme forms a template of which new nucleotides can be added onto. So it brings its own template to the strand that needs to be extended. Right? Um, and the end of the eukaryotic chromosome 
has a telomere sequence which is recognized by part of this RNA sequence. And I'll show that in some diagrams. So um, telomerase solves the end replication problem in eukaryotes because it's a, this is the word I was looking for earlier, it's a ribonuclear protein. A ribozyme is an enzyme that's only RNA. A ribonuclear protein is an enzyme that's a complex of RNA and protein. Okay, and um, so it's got a sequence of RNA that's complementary to the telomere sequence of the parental DNA, and it can use that to extend the three prime terminus of the linear chromosome so that shortening doesn't occur. All right, and this is how it works. So at the top there is the is the sort of um, the end of the double stranded um, chromosome here, and then at the end here you've got this telomere sequence, which is a six um, nucleotide um, re repeating sequence here. So, um, so in, in this textbook here, it's shown as two Ts and four Gs, two Ts, four Gs, so there's these six base pairs. So those six base pairs occur again and again, and it's just a, a repeating hexamer. And the enzyme here has a ribo, a, a, a bit of um, RNA embedded in it, which has a sequence which is complementary to that telomere end, so that this enzyme can bind to the, the single-stranded telomere sequence at the end of the chromosome. And I've tried to do an animation to describe this to you. So I'm showing here how the, 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 um, the, 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 the telomerase enzyme here binds to the end of the telomere sequence. So this is the parental um, strand, and this is the, um, the, 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 the bit of complementary base pairing between the RNA and the DNA. And then this sequence here acts as a template so that, nu so that nucleotides can come in and extend this end with this complementary sequence. So effectively, um, the, the telomerase shuffles along the end of the um, linear chromosome and adds these hexama repeats um, to the, the, the chromosome, okay? And then that allows the, um, the, 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 the so, so, so when you get, so when that's replicated, you're gonna get shortening, but then because it's been extended, the shortening is basically keeping the chromosome of the same length, okay? So you've got this process of lengthening the chromosome because you get shortening during DNA replication. And um, a lot of our somatic cells don't have telomerase, so we don't get this extension happening, so <coughs> replication leads to shortening. So um, this is just the textbook um, diagram for which I made my animation. So this is just showing the telomerase extending the, um, the, the sequence, and then the extended sequence here, if you think about an Okazaki fragment that's gonna be made here, this bit of RNA, cannot be digested away during the next round of replication, so that bit will become, um, it will get lost. And effectively, um, it's been extended and it's been lost, so it averages out. And then you also have these proteins that bind to the ends of our chromosomes to protect them from digestion. So that's just showing that as well. So, um, so proteins bind to the end of telomeres to protect, to protect them, and um, Effectively, the telomeres um, has been three prime extended or restored, and then um, you still have this bit of single-stranded DNA, which is sequestered by these DNA binding proteins to protect them. But what you also notice at the ends of chromosomes is this thing called a T-loop. So um, we know the end of the chromosome's got a little bit of single-stranded DNA, it falls back on itself, and then at some point when it falls back on itself, you actually get a bit of triple helices. You get this, this loose bit of DNA wrapping around the double to form this triple helix thing structure here. So, um, so the ends of our chromosomes, even though they're linear, you have this kind of looping structure here, and then this sort of, you know, bit of single-stranded DNA interacting with the double-stranded DNA, and then these binding proteins to protect the ends of our chromosomes from being digested um, away. So, just to finish off, um, so some, of, some cell types, like cancer cell types, they're able to hijack the um, telomerase and overexpress it. So, uh, I was saying it's not really expressed much in somatic cells, 
But when somatic cells become cancerous, then those genes are turned on inappropriately, and the, those cells are able to maintain and extend the, um, the lengths of the, um, the, the, the DNA. So effectively, cancer cells aren't limited to a certain number of replicative life cycles, so the cancer cells can replicate again and again and again and again. So basically, they're immortal, and they just keep growing. And um, yeah. All right, well, that's the end of the lecture. Um, thank you for your attention, and I shall see you next week. If you've got any questions, just come up and have a chat, and I'll try and explain things. Best I can.